Well, welcome everybody to the new, uh, the next uh, author in our Meet the Author series. We, today we have Guntis Goncarovs. I hope I said that right. Awesome. Um, awesome. <laughs> Guntis uh, has a passion for history. Uh, he's originally from New York, now from Connecticut. Uh, his stories are character driven, historically based, and focused on uh, the thoughts, perspective, facts, and uh, facts that may not be common knowledge. Uh, his books are Havana's Secret, which is a look behind the Spanish-American War, uh, Convergence of Valor, which is about uh, the men of the Civil War, submarine H.L. Hunley, and his forthcoming uh, uh, novel is uh, Secrecy and Gamesmanship, uh, which, uh, which is uh, about the, um, on the assassination of President William McKinley. Uh, for everybody who's joined us, we're just going to keep your video and uh, audio off for now, just to uh, keep down the confusion. But if you have a question, feel free to use the chat feature, and I will have you um, bring up your mic and your video if you'd like to uh, ask the question or comment to uh, Guntis yourself, or I can do it for you. We're also on Facebook Live, so everybody on Facebook Live, just use the chat feature, and uh, I'll relay your question or comment to Guntis. Guntis, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate being here. So go for it. Yep, go for it. Okay. It's all yours. Well, I, I I appreciate the opportunity to do a little video chat. I'm not uh, I'm not out in the uh, public arena here um, now. Usually, I am doing historically speaking uh, presentations concerning my books and the history behind the books themselves. Uh, so what I've done today is, is I've kind of put together a, uh, a, a combination of the four books that I have out at this point, uh, a little bit of uh, cut back on the presentations themselves so that I'm not uh, boring everybody to death with the historical detail that I've got there. Um, and, and then maybe we could open up for some questions afterwards, or, you know, if, if something pops up in the middle of, uh, uh, in the middle of the discussion, feel free to uh, drop in and ask the question. I, I've got no problem with doing the interaction. The books that I do have out at the present time, as Chris had started with, is Convergence of Valor is my first one. It's a story about the men of the H.L. Hunley, which is a Civil War submarine. Kind of an interesting story behind it is, is that uh, before I heard about the raising of the Hunley in the year 2000, um, out but just off of Charleston, South Carolina, I had no clue uh, that there was a, uh, a submarine no less such a successful submarine outside of returning to base um, after it uh, took down the first um, first ship in, 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 in battle. Um, but it was kind of kind of an interesting um, interesting way to introduce me to um, to the Civil War submarine, the Hunley. Um, it is available down at, uh, in Charleston to be able to take a look at. They have uh, recovered it, and I do have some eye candy in the uh, presentation concerning this. Uh, concerning the vessel. Second book that I want to talk a little bit about um, is where essentially the writing of novels started for me. It's a family saga called Telmanu Simnix, which in English is the Lord of Telmanu. And it's a story about my grandfather, um, who was an officer in the Tsarist cavalry, and kind of the story of how he goes from uh, be, have it, being a soldier, uh, a Latvian soldier in the Russian army, um, to becoming the head of the household in, uh, in Latvia uh, following, following the conflict. The third book, which I have a little bit more presentation about is Havana Secret, as Chris had uh, talked about. Um, and Havana Secret focuses around the Spanish-American War. But as the title implies, uh, there were a number of little things going on behind the scenes, uh, secrets which were taking place in Havana, if you will, uh, which kind of drove the storyline through uh, what was going on um, during the time frame, just prior to the sinking of the USS Maine and uh, our our movement into uh, into the Spanish American War, and the final story that I'll talk a little bit about is is a uh, um, is kind of a test that I gave myself uh, a couple of years back during the uh, National Writers Month, National no Novel Writers Month, and I was challenged by my writers group to write a uh, a romance novel, um, so to, to to stay away from the name, I picked a uh, um, I picked a uh, pen name for it. But Sarah's home is a is a 
paranormal romance, a soft paranormal romance, kind of a good story um, to, to work through uh, associated with um, this little house that uh, you see in the picture of the cover. So um, I'm going to move forward now, and I'll talk a little bit about the works in progress that I've got um, at the end. Uh, Convergence of Valor, um, Voices from the Civil War Submarine, the, the, the story of the men of the Hunland. Um, as I had introduced, it was, the, uh, it was the story of the men who had actually were the first submariners to, to get themselves under the water and, and, and attack an enemy vessel in, in battle. Um, and it was kind of interesting um, that, that the development of this submarine took place starting in uh, Mobile, Alabama with the Pioneer One, as you see in the, uh, in the picture here. Uh, the Pioneer Two was a, was a second iteration of, of the vessel. Uh, Hundley 2.0, if you will, and the, uh, the final vessel, which was successful, was uh, an eight-man crew, um, two conning towers, uh, an interesting little device here called a snorkel, um, which didn't work, um, but what it was supposed to do was to be able to um, allow the boat to remain subsurface, um, put, up the, uh, uh, put up the snorkel to be able to try to exchange air um, outside. It never worked. I think uh, part of Part of what had been discovered was that the bellows was uh, was kind of broken. The hose connecting the bellows to the to the snorkel was was broken, so um, didn't uh, didn't didn't function well. But the men who were actually putting this together, um, McClintock, Watson, and, and Hunley. Um, Hunley was a cop was a cotton um, cotton baron uh, down in Alabama. Uh, Watson was uh, was definitely the hands for uh, McClintock. Both of them were engineers uh, to be able to put this. Uh, put these vessels together. Um, all, uh, with the exception of the Pioneer, which was built in New Orleans, uh, the Pioneer II, uh, also known as the American Diver and the H.O. Hundley, were actually built in Mobile at the Park and Lion shop um, in, uh, in Mobile, Alabama. Um, now, this is what an uh, artist's depiction of what the Hundley would have looked like as it was patrolling or actually doing some sea trials, if you will, in Mobile Bay. And the reason that I know that it's it's Mobile and not Charleston is because on the front side of the vessel, you can't see a spar torpedo, um, which is what was added when they moved the uh, boat from, uh, from Mobile over to Charleston itself. But kind of an interesting uh, interesting feature, you've got the propeller with a shroud around it, um, the, uh, the external, uh, external rudder itself, and you definitely had some ballast on the outside. The two conning towers, um, which gave them uh, the ability to be able to see if you had uh, the ability to see, if you will, um, plus uh, a little bit of a um, your diving planes uh, up in front. Now, the next picture is actually a, a front on view um, artist depiction of what the Hunley would have looked like in Charleston, where you see the actual spar torpedo was put, you know, on the front side of the vessel. One of the things to take a look at, though, is, is that it's kind of amazing that the people that had put this vessel together um, cobbled it together out of a couple of old boilers, um, try to make the streamlining up front to be able to really get this get this puppy moving. You had a uh, had a nice little uh, cut water up in the front of this conning tower here, and you had deadlights to be able to see just above the surface or just below the surface as, as best you could. Um, so this was a kind of a nice little depiction to be able to see what the what the Hunley would have looked like on patrol. Um, as I had mentioned before, in the year 2000, um, Clyde, Clyde Cussler and Numa had actually discovered where the Hunley was sitting uh, just outside of Charleston, about two miles out in Charleston Bay, um, and had worked together to try to uh, recover the Hunley to bring it back in order to do some reconstruction on it. Now, in order to do that, think about this, is that this vessel was under the water for close to 150 years. And being under, under seawater for about 150 years uh, as metal, the metal would be very, very brittle. So what they had to do is had to devise this sling apparatus um, to be able to dig through the sand and kind of slip underneath the vessel itself in order to pull it up on this barge before they could bring it back uh, into shore. So here's some eye candy about the Hunley itself. Um, as it was pulled up and brought back to shore, uh, what it what it actually looked like, uh, you can see the the um, uh, the streamlining up front. 
Uh, down here is where the spar torpedo would have been hooked onto. And here's where your support would have been hooked onto. Those were additions when they had brought the vessel to Charleston. Uh, you can see a bit of the diving plane as well, as well as the conning towers. Um, this is a rear view of what the Hunley uh, was. You can see the shroud was kind of cut away a little bit, as well as some damage to the propeller. Now, one of, one of the thoughts as to why the Hunley never returned to base, uh, or never returned to, uh, to Breach Inlet after, uh, after it took the Housatonic down, was you know, what actually happened to it. My theory, I talked about it a little bit with some of the friends of the Hunley, was is that it was actually clipped on the backside of the vessel and it was not able to, to resurface or, uh, or work itself back to, back to shore. Now, when they brought the, um, the Hunley back to Charleston at the, uh, at the Naval Center, um, they had actually put it into a bath. Um, and this bath was, was, uh, was a saltwater bath with a little bit of uh, alkaline solution in it, sodium hydroxide, if you will, um, to try to help draw some of the ions out of the metal. The thought process with this would be to electrically stimulate the movement of those ions out of the uh, out of the metal to provide more support, so that the metal could actually uh, support the weight of the of the of the Hunley itself. Now, of course, I start digging into all of the, the chemical nature of it. I'm a chemist by by degree, so uh, you know I'm kind of interested in the chemistry end of things. Now, this this process of desalination. Um, that they had used at the uh, at the Sproul Center down in Charleston, um, actually took a very very long time because you you add the electric current to the water and to try to drive this out. It's a very slow process in order to do that. Uh, while they were doing this, every once in a while they would drain, do a little bit of excavation on the inside, and then refill this uh, this water bath. Um, about two three years ago itself, they had actually completed the desalination process. Uh, for the Hunley. So it took uh, a good 10 years to actually get that done. And they had gone through the process of, of de-encrustment of the outside of the vessel as well as the inside of the vessel. And I've got a couple of shots uh, later on in the uh, presentation where you can see that. Now this is a picture of what was, uh, what was the bath, the water bath itself. And as you can see, the Hunley is now supporting itself, uh, indicating that the desalination process was complete. Um, as they're working through the process of reconstructing the Hunley, um, they had to get it up into a, into a normal position so that they'd actually see what, was, what they were doing and to also get the beam custom going. Um, some nice pictures of the, uh, uh, of the vessel in the tank as it's dry. Um, imagine crawling into this vessel in order to dig at to some, of the, uh, some of the artifacts that were on the inside. Interesting piece which kind of drove me to writing the story was is that they found the skeletons of the sailors, some other artifacts associated with the sailors themselves, actually at their stations, indicating they were not jumbled down in one corner. They didn't drown from, from a sudden surge of water coming into the vessel itself. There was some other reason as to why they had uh, stood at their posts while, uh, while, they, uh, while they died. Now, this is a closer view of what the, um, what the propeller and the shroud itself it looks like, and you can see that there was actually damage. It's not um, eroded away. You know, it was actually damage that had taken place on the on the shroud, which kind of led me to believe that the reason for the you know why it didn't return was that when the Canadagua, which was a rescue ship um, coming to the to the honey itself, um, had actually clipped the back side of the vessel. Uh, and one of the pieces that kind of leads me to that conclusion was is that remember in the earlier pictures. There was a uh, an external um, rudder, if you will, on the back side of the vessel itself. It's missing here. Um, the rudder was actually found um, inland side of where the Hunley was found, uh, indicating that it was clipped off before it actually sank and, and drifted out a little bit further out. Um, now, the bottom picture here is what it looks like as it took as you took off the crust. And, Pretty, pretty decent with respect to the metal itself. All these little holes that you see along the line, this was put together, as I had mentioned before, uh, out, of, out of two old boilers. Um, and 
the, the rivet, riveting job that was actually performed on the vessel was absolutely amazing um, in order to make sure that this vessel was watertight. Here's a, a pretty picture of, um, of, the, of the cleanup um, of the Hunley itself to be able to take a good look at how this vessel was constructed um, and, and getting it back to the uh, reconstruction phase, if you will. So, um, you know, that's, that's the vessel itself. Um, and as I had mentioned, what drove me to writing the book about the men of the Hunley was when they took the skeletons out, they did forensic reconstructions of the faces. And when they did the forensic reconstructions of the faces, they put it together with some of the artifacts that were found at each person's station. And I'm just going to go through a little bit of the characters, if you will, of the story um, here. This picture, by the way, is a picture of the Hunley as it was... Uh, being stored at the docks on the Cooper River down in Charleston itself, uh, which kind of led, led me to a little snippet that I've actually used in, uh, in my latest book that I'm, that I'm working on now. Now, the, in, in position number one, you know, there are eight sailors on the, on the vessel. Position number one was the captain, uh, George Dixon. Uh, Dixon was an Ohio native, um, born in Ohio, but he actually worked on the, uh, on the Mississippi River uh, for the river boats. Um, Dixon was a, was a sailor sailor, despite that he was actually in, um, in the 21st Alabama, which was, a, which was an army. Um, didn't take any gruff from anybody, uh, including uh, his higher ups. Uh, had many discussions when, uh, when he was with the 21st Alabama with General uh, Beauregard, um, who was the head for the, uh, the Western Front for the, uh, for the Confederacy. Um, now, <clears throat> Dixon, was uh, was spending time on the uh, on the Mississippi River running riverboats um, for a guy by the name of Bennett. And before the war broke out, um, Dixon had eyes, and uh, Bennett's daughter had eyes for him. Um, and they actually were engaged before he uh, uh, before he went off the battle in the twenty first Alabama. Now Queenie Bennett had given Dixon a twenty dollar coin piece as a good luck charm. And as luck would have it, or as, as history would have it, um, when, uh, when the Battle of Shiloh took place in April of 1862, um, Dixon actually took a musket bullet to his leg. When he took the musket bullet, it actually hit the coin square, saved his leg, saved his life, which is why he had the inscription of my life preserver, GED, on the, uh, on the, on the coin when he was recovering in, in Mobile. Kind of interesting that this coin was actually found um, at Dixon Station on the uh, on the Hundley when they had pulled it up. You know, digging through all the muck and everything, which is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting little piece. Kind of tied uh, tied Dixon together with what was actually going on here. In the second position was Arnold Becker. Uh, Arnold Becker was actually European descent, um, and they had determined that because back in the day, back in the 1800s or so. A, a typical diet for the um, for Europeans was a was a wheat based diet, whereas um, in the United States it was a corn based diet. And as a result of that, um, you could be able to tell as to whether or not this person was just recently here or whether they had been here for a while. Arnold Becker was one of those that was actually European, probably German descent, um, but he may have known Dixon prior to the conflict because he was working the riverboats um, on the Mississippi as well, which may be why, you know, Dixon had a, uh, um, when Dixon knew that Becker was available when he was picking his crew for the Hunley, um, actually had pulled, pulled at Arnold Becker. Um, Becker spent time on the, uh, on the CSS Polk, uh, which was a riverboat, uh, met its demise on the Mississippi River itself, spent a little bit of time on the Arkansas, um, and then was uh, shipped over to a, uh, a receiving ship in Charleston, uh, waiting for uh, another assignment, if you will. Um, injured during the time frame, definitely a skilled sailor, um, and worked himself into the uh, into the position, the second position, which would have been responsible for um, for the snorkel, which didn't work. Um, number three uh, was uh, Seamus Lumpkin, um, as best as I could tell. Um, this guy was big. You know, he was six. 6'2", 6'3", perhaps, 
um, and the and the pipe depicts one of the uh, one of the artifacts that they had found with his teeth is that he had some pipe notches. Um, the the discussion that had taken place and all of the stories that had come out during the time frame of these homely sailors over in Charleston was this guy was never seen without that pipe. Um, his pipe was actually found in his his position. Now you know the third, fourth, and fifth seats were what I call the horseman seats. And these guys were the ones that were actually pushing that crank um, to the point where they were able to push the, uh, the vessel up to um, uh, up to roughly four knots. Um, this crank was, was engineered meticulously. Uh, it was an articulated crank for you know, six people actually pushing, uh, pushing the vessel out um, that was connected by a number of gears back to the propeller itself. Uh, ratio, I believe, was one to one point four. I think was the uh, was the downsized ratio for between the um, the crank itself and the, and the propeller. Lumpkin was um, was European descent, even though there is a Lumpkin um, family, if you will, or a lineage to Lumpkin in the uh, in the um, in the Georgia area, which is kind of a kind of interesting. I couldn't. Couldn't put uh, Lumpkin together with uh, with the Lumpkin clan that was down in in, in, uh, in Georgia, uh, but nonetheless he was European descent. Probably came over uh, during the conflict time frame or just prior to the conflict, uh, maybe visiting and when 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 hostilities broke out. Number four in line. Um, okay, why don't we just break there for a second? Um, this kind of gives you a depiction of what it would look like. A four foot diameter tube sticking a six foot per, uh, six foot um, tall man uh, inside this vessel to be able to work this crank um, underneath the, uh, um, in the in the vessel to push it forward. This is a uh, an actual picture prior to the cleanup. Uh, you can tell because it's somewhat listed, and you can see all the way to the rear. So this is from from the floor of the vessel all the way to the aft position. Uh, you can see the articulated crank as it works through the backside, connected to the gears, which are connected to the propeller on, on the backside itself. The sailors would have been sat in, sitting on the uh, oak plank, uh, which was here, in order to uh, work the vessel itself. So not really comfortable positions. I think OSHA would have some problems with the confined space uh, issues here. But it was, uh, um, it was a position of, of valor. It was a condition of valor that we needed to work this, work this vessel itself. Now, this is a before they did the de impressment cleaning it up, and this is afterwards, um, where you can see the vessel is actually sitting up. This area here is where the oak plank was, that they had taken out to do a little bit of work on it. And you can see where you've got um, the, the connection back to the rudder actually working back underneath the. Um, um, underneath the, where, the, where the bench was. And you can see how the cranks are actually set up with the articulation all the way back to the, to the gearing in the back side. So number four on the list was Frank Collins. Uh, Frank Collins was, was American, uh, grew up in you know, just outside of Richmond, uh, probably Frederick, Fredericksburg itself. Uh, he was an orphan um, and he ended up um, uh, being raised by his uncles, uh, his uncle in, uh, in Fredericksburg. His uncle was a cobbler, um, which is where you have this cobbler's needle uh, sticking out of uh, out of Collins's uh, Collins's mouth. Kind of another large fellow, um, definitely six foot or so, um, and clearly uh, you know, clearly one of the stronger stronger men on board. In the fifth position was J.F. Carlson. Carlson's got an interesting story, a very interesting story behind him. Uh, whereas um, when when he came to the states. Uh, Norwegian or Northern European is, is pretty much what I can glean from, uh, uh, from the facial structure. Um, he was considered a seaman on the um, privateer vessel, the Jefferson Davis, uh, which was a very successful privateer vessel prior to the conflict breaking out itself. Now, he also had a buddy, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, Carlson uh, was one of the men that was on this vessel itself. When it ran aground in St. Augustine, um, as a result of uh, potential mutiny um, that had taken place, um, he decided that he was going to go to Charleston, and he joined up with the first German battalion, um, so, or battery. So, so 
the the battery itself is where Carlson Carlson had ended up prior to his assignment to the Hummer, but definitely had a, uh, a, a Navy background, if you will, or, or a uh, maritime background. Now, one of the interesting pieces behind Carlson, um, outside of the uh, you know being on this privateer vessel, was tradition for a um, uh, for a Norseman, Viking, if you will, is to provide your first officer or provide your captain with a good luck charm. As I had mentioned, Carlson was part of the German battalion out of Charleston. And during the uh, uh, during a Union invasion of Morris Island, where the Union was defeated, um, the 7th Connecticut uh, was actually there. Um, now, when they found this coin at the position of Ridgeway, who was the first officer, they couldn't quite understand exactly what was going on. Ezra Chamberlain was a, uh, uh, was a volunteer for the 7th Connecticut. Um, this was his service medallion, if you will. Um, and the rumors were floating around that he was actually a spy on the, uh, on the Hunley, which was why the Hunley had sank. Um, in actuality, what had happened was that Ezra Chamberlain was part of the battalion uh, or part of the regiment that had fought on Morris Island. He was killed on Morris Island. J.F. Carlson was part of the um, part of picket duty uh, to go over to Morris Island. And he actually picked up Ezra Chamberlain's coin or Ezra Chamberlain's medallion as a, uh, as a, um, you know, as a souvenir. He provided it to Ridgeway as a good luck charm, Ridgeway being the first officer for their uh, mission on February 17th. The other guy that was on the Jefferson Davis was Sam or Augustus Miller. Not exactly sure what his real name is. Um, we kind of, um, the friends of the Hundley kind of settled on Samuel Miller. It may have been Mueller, it may have been something else. Uh, this guy was, was kind of interesting from the perspective was he was one of the older men and has virtually no background in the United States. He's listed solely as Sam Miller, as best I can tell, on the, uh, on the Jefferson Davis in 1861. Then he shows up on the Hunley with J.F. Carlson in February of 1862. So he's got like a three-year time frame that nobody has any clue as to where this guy was. Um, had a rough life before he came to the States, and that rough life included um, a, a fractured skull, a couple of broken bones, a broken leg, uh, and a couple of fractured ribs. So he he'd, uh, he'd has he'd had his scrapes in the past. Now, um, this is the guy that I kind of focused on in, in, in writing the uh, um, novelized history. Uh, this is a perfect person or a perfect character to be able to, to, to dig into because he's got no history. There are no prison records no battalion records. He didn't sign up with Carlson with the uh, German battalion, um, just kind of went, if you will, on the land. So he was a great little focal point in order to write the story from you know, this guy's viewpoint for the most part, to see what was going on with respect to the hunting and how it, uh, how it accomplished what he'd done. Um, now, this is probably one of my favorite characters is, uh, is James Wicks. Um, he was the only one that was married. Um, he, uh, he got married before he joined up with the U.S. Navy in 1840. Um, so that by the time, uh, I'm sorry, 1850. So by the time that the conflict had broken out, he had had you know plenty of time with the U.S. Navy and assigned to the USS Congress. Now the USS Congress was assigned to um, was assigned to blockade duty of Hampton Roads, um, and when they were assigned to to uh, blockade duty there um, in order to try to uh, try to cut off the Confederacy from any uh, any uh, any incoming um, any incoming supplies from the ocean from the Atlantic Ocean, um, the Congress along with the Cumberland and uh, and three other ships were, were positioned to to keep anybody out. Unfortunately, when the um, when the Confederacy had actually taken over the Navy Yard in Norfolk. Um, they had discovered that there was a hull that was slightly burnt out um, for the uh, for the um, ship of line called or the uh, brig called the uh, called the Merrimack. Um, now, when I grew up in upstate New York, 
Well, I always heard about the uh, Battle of the Ironclads being the Monitor versus the Merrimack. I was corrected very quickly when I was down south um, in that it was the CSS Virginia. It was not the Merrimack. Uh, because what the Confederates had done, what the Confederate Navy had done, is actually took the hull of the Merrimack and built up a casement on top of it with, you know, as you can see, the um, the boiler and the whole works in order to, to run this run this puppy out of uh, out into Hampton Roads. Now, <clears throat> on the on the day of March eighth, uh, 1862, the Virginia was done. It was ready to go out and and uh, try to take down these five uh, five vessels that were causing blockading. Uh, problems in Hampton Roads. Um, and this is a depiction of what had occurred in the sinking of the Cumberland um, and not the Congress. Um, however, the same, um, same demise occurred with the, uh, with the Congress itself. Now, remember, we had talked that Wicks was actually on the Congress. So when the Virginia came and actually took the Congress down, you know, now Wicks had become a prisoner, if you will. Um, there, was a, there was an interesting snippet in the, uh, in the, in the records indicating that um, even though he may have been considered a, um, no, considered a prisoner of war, he had actually volunteered for service in the, uh, in the Confederacy at that point because his duty to the U.S. Navy was done when the, Cong when the Congress had sunk. Now, during their time in, in Charleston, one of the things that was, was interesting was is that he still had his Navy P coat. And this button, uh, this rubber button for the U.S. Navy was actually found at his position in the Hunley itself when they had pulled it out for, uh, for artifacts. Uh, kind of an he, he was known to have worn his P coat around uh, Charleston when it was getting a little chilly uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the winter months prior to their, uh, prior to their mission. Now, the last guy that I had talked about was Joseph Ridgway, uh, first officer, number eight in the crew. Um, Ridgway was one of the original three uh, horsemen for the Senate. Big guy, um, you know, definitely six foot or so. But the, the story behind Ridgway was that he grew up in, in Maryland. And growing up in Maryland, his family was a seafaring family. He was on Eastern Shore of Maryland, and they had worked uh, commerce between Eastern Shore, Western Shore of Maryland, and, and worked themselves out. So much so that Ridgway actually had his semen certificate by the time he was a teenager and had worked himself there. So the guy really knew um, you know, how to work a boat and how to work, uh, work the maritime uh, routine. So it's kind of interesting that uh, Ridgway was one of the ones that had actually volunteered to become part of the Hunter's crew. So these are the guys that actually had put together. Now, you think about it. Nobody really knew what a submarine was at the time. They called it a torpedo boat, fish boat, all sorts of things. Not only that, the Hunley had sunk twice before in Charleston Bay um, with the loss of about 13, uh, 13 sailors. And why these guys would volunteer, and yes, they did volunteer um, to take their positions on the Hunley. Um, it definitely shows a little bit of courage uh, to be able to venture into the unknown. Um, to become essentially the first uh, submariners. Now, <clears throat> part of where the title comes from, Convergence of Valor, is that if you take a look at a, a map of the Charleston area itself, uh, you can see that you have a convergence of the Wano, the Stoner, uh, Stono, and the, and the Cooper Rivers, which combine into, the, um, into, the, into Charleston Bay uh, prior to it heading on out. Kind of an interesting little, um, um, in, in, interesting little piece here with respect to the, uh, the currents that were actually in here. Now, remember the earlier picture that we had of the Hunley uh, did not have a um, didn't have a spar torpedo. They had used the spar torpedo or put the spar torpedo on when they got to Charleston because instead of towing a torpedo or towing a mine, which very well could get caught up in the current blow themselves up, they figured that they wanted to have a little bit more control over their, uh, over their, their ordinance. Um, so as a result, that's what they did is they added a, a spar on the front side so that they could make a frontal attack um, to, uh, to any vessel that they were going to go for. Originally, the Hunley was docked um, in the Cooper River, on the Cooper River docks. You saw the picture that we had before. 
Now, eventually what ended up happening is that they ended up putting the Charleston or Char- putting the Hunley over here at Breach Inlet uh, between the Isle of Palms and Sol- Sullivan's Island. And this is where they were able to work themselves out to the seaward side of the Housatonic in order to take the Housatonic down for their, for their mission. Now, Beauregard, who was now the head of the Charleston defense, um, and Dixon, um, and here they go again, butting heads. Um, Beauregard wanted Dixon to head straight out and take down the Wabash, which was the, uh, was the flagship for the, um, for the, for the flotilla, uh, for the blockade of Charleston itself. Um, Dixon said, it doesn't make any sense to be able to do this. They see us coming. They'll probably have the, the, the gates or the rakes that are out on the, uh, on the seaward, on the landward side of the vessels themselves to keep them from getting, uh, getting punctured. What we need to do is we make, need to make a seaward attack. And in order to do the seaward attack to make it realistic, um, to make it real, make it happen, um, we have to go out past the blockade and go and make a seaward attack. The only vessel that they could see that they could do that with was the Housatonic, um, which is this one over here. And on February 17, 1864, they were successful in making this seaward approach and torpedoed the Housatonic. Now, unfortunately, the Hunley was never seen again until the year 2000 uh, after, this, uh, um, after this attack, which led to a lot of conjecture as to what had actually happened. Was there a, uh, was there a bullet um, that actually hit one of the dead lights on the conning tower, you know, from the people that were uh, shooting down. Um, that was debunked because um, Dixon would have been looking through the conning tower itself, and there were no bullet wounds in his head itself. Um, the men did not drown because they were at their stations. The bilge pump was not being used, was not in a in bilge function. Um, so as a result, what uh, what they had determined was is that when the Hunley had pulled itself back, um, it was clipped by the Canandaigua, which was coming to pick up any of the survivors. When the Canandaigua came by, it actually clipped the backside of the Hunley. This is my conjecture, by the way. Um, clipped, clipped the backside of the Hunley, took off the rudder, and they went down to, to sit and wait for the tide to change so they could move um, back, to, uh, back to shore. Unfortunately, they miscalculated a couple of things. One, when you're pushing that crank, you only have a certain amount of air that's in this, in this enclosed vessel. So very well, they asphyxiated uh, afterwards because they simply did not have the air to last any longer. Um, they, they had done an experiment, a test, to see how long the air would last within the enclosed vessel, and it was about two hours. So all this time frame that they had done um, to come out to take down the vessel itself, you know, may very well have expired all of the air that was available. You know, as a result, they may have uh, may have had some some issues with respect to um, not not really understanding the danger that they were in, um, and as a result, uh, they died at their stations uh, on the on the uh, floor of Charleston Bay. Now, just recently, there was a discovery of the, the spar. Um, and when they looked at the spar itself, you can see the copper plating, which was holding the torpedo, uh, was kind of peeled back, indicating that there was a detonation of the torpedo before they actually got the spar further on out um, with the torpedo sunk into the, into the Housatonic. This led a couple of people or a number of people at, at uh, Duke when they were doing at Duke University um, doing an investigation associated with uh, with the Hunley itself, thinking that the, the premature detonation of the torpedo, 130 pounds or so of gunpowder, if you will, um, actually had blown back and knocked everybody out in the vessel itself. And as a result, they, uh, they concussed uh, as a result of that. Um, it was kind of, that theory was kind of debunked because if you take a look at the streamlining, the concussion wave, you probably would have stun them a little bit, but not necessarily put them completely out. Um, so uh, interesting artifact, um, interesting theory, um, but not necessarily um, a winner. I do have to provide some credits uh, with respect to the book because I, I do a lot of research associated with this. 
the friends of the Hunley uh, down in Charleston, um, amazing people. I mean, they know the nuts and bolts of this vessel itself. You know, maybe not necessarily the, the men of the Hunley, but the actual mechanics uh, were uh, mechanics of the vessel itself. Um, the the I, I don't know if they're open now as a result of, uh, of the COVID um, the COVID issue, um, but prior to COVID, um, the the Hunley was available for viewing on on weekends, uh, which is a a great thing to take a look at, I and mean, you can actually see. Uh, see this history that was there. Uh, Brian Hicks was a reporter from the Charleston Co Post and Courier um, who had followed the recovery of the Hunley and the restoration of the Hunley itself. Uh, definitely a brilliant individual, a great reporter, um, and, and uh, had a lot of information put together uh, that I was able to, to, to glean off. Richard Bach and Mark Reagan had written books about submarines prior to, uh, prior to the 1900s, um, and also Glenn McConnell, who was the president of the who's presently the president of the College of Charleston um, at the time, was the head of the recovery effort for the, uh, for the Hunley itself. I had a discussion with, uh, with Mr. McConnell um, about that um, to make sure that, that he understood and we have a little gentleman's agreement as to when we finally discover what had actually happened to the Hunley itself, we'll probably be able to sit down and have a, uh, have a pep So the, the, the book itself is dedicated to the final crew of the Hunley. Um, listed here, and there are also um, uh, buried in Magnolia Cemetery. And I'm going to try something here, you know, just to kind of focus a little bit. If you take a look at the um, my zoom, you can zoom. Okay. Uh, zoom. Sorry about that. Previously. Okay, well, that's not going to happen. Um, but if, if you take a look at the headstones um, on the, uh, at, the, at the Magnolia Cemetery, you'll notice that there were two people that were actually listed as um, what's going on here? Can you guys see me at this point? Yeah, we can still see you. It's uh, showing the um, secrets from the uh, Spanish, the, your, your um, Havana secret. Um, okay, it says on screen sharing that I've lost my PowerPoint itself. Uh, let's see. It was stuck on your. Um, it was it was the the cemetery shot. Then uh, yeah. it went to Havana Secret, and then it was on that for a little while. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna bop out real quick, and boom, I'm gonna cut that out. Come on. Okay. I apologize for this. The uh, the internet out here in the in the wilds of New Hampshire may not necessarily always be completely functional. <laughs> So, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, is what was going on with the, um, uh, with the headstones is, is that two people are actually listed as CSA, uh, Confederate States Army, rather than CSN, Confederate States Navy. All right. And let's go to slideshow. Okay, so you guys are seeing the PowerPoint at this point? No, we're still showing your uh, 
your um, your local drives there. Yeah. I believe if you click on the share screen, you should be able to pick which um, which window you want to want to show. How's that? You got it. No, it still shows your your local disk. Okay, it says I'm screen sharing on this. Well, you're screen sharing. You just have the wrong screen, wrong uh, uh, thing selected. So if you go down to the bottom where the screen uh, share screen is, and you click on that, it should bring up a window that shows all the tabs that are open on your computer. And then click on the one that you that has the the slideshow. All right. Share screen, boom. Back. There we go. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to fast forward here. Where I was. Okay, I'm not going to play around with trying to uh, <laughs> um, try to do that zoom again. But if you take a look at Dixon, as well as Carlson, um, you'll see that uh, they're they're um, they're listed as as Confederate States Army and not Navy. Kind of interesting that the captain of the boat was actually our army guy. So this is a, a nice little view of uh, of Magnolia Cemetery where the uh, where the remains are are buried. So. That's the piece. That's the first piece that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Was the uh, was the the Hunley and Convergence of Valley. So the, the next piece that I do want to step into is Secrets from the Spanish American War, which kind of deals with Havana Secret, uh, which was a um, second book that I had written, actually first in a series of what I call the uh, Emerging Empires or Intrepid Empires. Kind of an interesting uh, trilogy that I've got thinking that I'm thinking of doing. And this one, Secrecy and Gamesmanship, is coming up. And then I've got another one about the Panama Canal, which will be following, uh, following that itself. Now, the Spanish American War, in and of itself, kind of starts uh, the, the focus of Havana's Secret, you know, starts in Cuba. And in the, uh, in the late 1890s, um, there was, you know, Obviously, the USS Maine in 1898 uh, was taken down. But all these guys, all these fellows that you see that are showing up on the screen now, have little secrets associated with what was going on behind the scenes uh, prior to the Spanish-American War, as well as prior to uh, the sinking of the Maine. And this is an artist's depiction of what sinking of the Maine may have looked like, or the explosion of the Maine may have looked like itself. This part was actually a, uh, um, a, a historical presentation that I call Secrets from the Spanish-American War. And I talk about the involvement of you know, all of these fellows uh, that you actually see here. Um, not gonna talk a whole lot about Teddy Roosevelt. Um, at the time, he was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, but there are a couple little snippets associated with him. Um, McKinley was the president at the time. And these other two fellows, um, Richard Wainwright, who was the, uh, executive officer for the Maine, had a very interesting little background prior to his time to the Maine, um, as well as General Fitzhugh Lee, who was the uh, Consul General in, in Havana. Um, Fitzhugh Lee, as the name would imply, actually was the uh, uh, nephew of Robert E. Lee, um, which kind of gives a little bit of a, of a Confederacy flavor um, going on. 
associated with, uh, with what he was doing. So in 1895 in Cuba, um, the Spanish government was, uh, was in control and they were kind of um, put their thumbs down on a lot of the, a lot of the Cubans looking for, uh, looking for independence. And three of the mo more important uh, people associated with, um, uh, with the movement, uh, with the freedom movement in, in Cuba were uh, Maximo Gomez, uh, the general, uh, Colecto Garcia, as well as uh, Jose Marti. Now, Jose Marti was actually not a military person. Marti was a poet. Um, didn't really have a lot of um, a lot of wherewithal to be able to handle uh, the battles on the battlefield, but his heart was definitely in uh, in the revolution for, for Cuban independence. A lot of the um, a, a lot of this, the poems that were written for uh, for Cuba that used as incentive um, for the Cuban Revolution, uh, the early, the first Cuban Revolution for independence, if you will. Um, where it was written by Martin. Um, as I had mentioned before, uh, the consulate, consul general was uh, Fitzhugh Lee, that was the US consul general, um, had an office in Havana um, and he was responsible for making sure that the uh, welfare of the US citizens that were frequenting Cuba at the time uh, was gonna be taken care of. Now Fitzhugh Lee, as I had mentioned, had a little bit of a background. His, uh, his uncle was um, Robert E. Lee um, and he may very well have had a spiring uh, out of the consulate. Um, and it was kind of interesting, though, one of the things that kind of pointed to that, uh, which we'll talk, talk about um, here shortly. Now, in 1897, as things progressed, uh, Spain's prime minister ended up, uh, was, was killed by an anarchist. Um, and that was um, Cabanos, uh, and then Sagasta had taken over afterwards, um, and as a result, um, even more pressure was put on the Cubans to try to uh, try to move, move away. Um, the United States was growing in strength and importance, um, drawing in Hawaii, and they were also uh, concerned about what was going on in the Caribbean. Um, Kaiser Wilhelm was interested in the Caribbean as well. He had um, had control over uh, Hispaniola, um, including Haiti, and I didn't really care much for uh, for Haiti with his French background. Um, however. He was consolidating his power in Germany and wanted his place in the sun. And one of the things that he was pushing for was um, the Western uh, Western nations uh, to, try to try to push himself there. Uh, the Boer War was starting in South Africa, uh, where Germany was getting its fingers involved into that um, um, as well. Um, France was starting to build an inner ocean canal across the uh, across Central America. Um, they were not successful in doing so. They were thinking that they would be able to drive this thing across um, across Nicaragua and, and kind of fell flat, which is where Teddy Roosevelt actually came in a number of years later um, to be able to put the Panama Canal together. And Cuba and the Philippines were struggling for independence from Spain because they were becoming increasingly oppressive to the uh, um, to those countries or to those islands. Um, in the summer of 1897, McKinley was trying to negotiate with the um, uh, with the Spain with the Spanish with the Spanish government to get freedom for Cuba to have them essentially take the reins off and, and, and let Cuba move toward independence. Um, very unsuccessful. He was trying to trying to do it from a diplomatic standpoint. Um, however, a lot of people, including the Yellow Press, was pushing to we, we, we've got to physically kicked the Spaniards out. Um, and not only was um, was the yellow press doing that, but a number of the uh, number of people in Congress were actually pushing for that as well. So um, as the moniker started, uh, 1897, the world had changed. Um, a lot of things were actually changing and moving forward. And there were a lot of things going on down in Cuba at the time. Um, now, the, the U.S. Navy was really not in good shape uh, following the Civil War, and there wasn't a lot of, um, a lot of rebuilding uh, going on for the, uh, for the Navy. Now, what Roosevelt had noticed um, as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy was, this is something that we need to do in order for allowance to be able to expand. Their first thought was armored cruisers, 
uh, to put armored cruisers together rather than the dreadnoughts that many of the Europeans were heading after, you know, dreadnoughts being these huge monsters that were out there, um, an armed cruiser would be would definitely be a little bit more uh, um, deaf to be able to move around and, and mobile, uh, mobile to be able to move around. A bit. The main, however, had a very interesting, um, interesting construction where you can see the turrets for the um, uh, for the big guns were on opposite sides and but actually when they were firing would actually push the vessel um, almost to capsizing uh, when they were doing that. So they were limited to what they could actually use as armament um, in these uh, in these little puppies uh, on the vessels themselves. Outside of that, gorgeous looking vessel. Um, you know, definitely had the speed, uh, definitely had the ability to be able to move, uh, move quickly. Um, now, the main was commissioned in around 1897 um, under a Cronin shield. Um, however, when it actually went into service, um, the first uh, first captain uh, was put in place was Captain Charles Sigsby. Grew up in the Albany area. Um, definitely had a couple of uh, couple of friends. Had spent time with uh, the oceanographic group um, with the Navy, and this was his first command, you know, first essential command itself. Uh, Sigsby was kind of an interesting, interesting fellow. He was allowed to be able to pick all of his officers uh, for the for the vessel, um, kind of the, the the cream of the crop, if you will, with one exception. Um, the person that he had chosen for his first officer um, was actually Arnold uh, Maris. He was told that no, your executive officer is going to be Lieutenant Commander Richard Wainwright. Um, la a long history in the Navy for the Wainwright family. Um, and just prior to his assignment to the USS Maine, Wainwright was the head of the Office of Naval Investigation. So the guy was essentially the head spy for the Navy uh, prior to his assignment to, to, the, uh, to the Maine. Kind of an interesting little piece that, uh, that had started the thought process of what possibly could happen to the Maine itself. Um, now, as I had mentioned, the Yellow Press was very, uh, very active. Uh, Pulitzer and Hearst were always looking to one-up each other uh, with some additional innuendo as to what was going on in Cuba itself. To the point where Hearst uh, put together a plot um, to free up Evangelina um, Casio Cisneros. Evangelina Cisneros was imprisoned by the Spaniards um, because she was the daughter of one of the revolutionary um, um, uh, generals, um, um, General Cisneros. Um, now, Cisneros ended up dying in, uh, um, in prison, uh, General Cisneros, and uh, Evangelina uh, wanted, um, wanted to get back to the actual island itself. Uh, she was imprisoned with a number of, um, uh, shall we say, prostitutes and um, ne'er-do-wells um, in a, a female prison on the, uh, on the Isle of Pines. Um, just just south of Cuba itself, and the thought process that um, Hearst and and um, and Pulitzer had was that why don't we go and break her out of jail? Now, uh, the New York Post actually had a uh, had an office um, just um, uh, just underneath the uh, consulate, and the question had always been proposed. Was actually Consul General Fitzhugh Lee involved um, with this breakout of Cisneros? Um, the, the jailbreak was successful um, in the uh, uh, was successful at the time, and Cisneros was brought to New York, where she ended up marrying one of her uh, um, one of the people that she had, had escorted prior to uh, prior to the war itself. Um, kind of an interesting little piece that Consul General. Um, Lee had suggested that you know maybe this is what we needed to do in order to spur the uh, spur the movement toward independence, and never admitted until late in his life that yes he actually had headed up this little spy ring to um, uh, to free Cisneros. <clears throat> now at the time, um, the, the Secret Service was kind of you know running around trying to take care of. Um, uh, the United States with, with um, um, counterfeiters and, and uh, 
uh, and moonshiners uh, to try to cut that down. Now, the Secret Service had a uh, had a little bit of a, um, a hole that needed to be filled, uh, seen by Roosevelt, and he said, you know, what I really need is I need somebody for international intelligence to be able to get that information out to me so that I could understand where I needed to send the Navy that I was rebuilding. John Wilkie was a uh, uh, was a newspaper man out of out of Chicago, had actually done some some discussions with um, um, with um, discussions with the railroads uh, and negotiations with the railroads. Um, so Roosevelt was very uh, keen on Wilkie and brought him into the uh, um, into the uh, the government um, and put him in charge of the Secret Service and had him on the side, work on this international uh, piece of things. So he was always in conflict a bit with Lee because Lee wanted to do things his way. Wilkie wanted to have the information. Um, so his, uh, his agents, Wilkie's agents, were actually working for two bosses, Wilkie as well as Lee, while they were in Cuba. Kind of an interesting little caveat that was going on. Now, um, here's the beauty on the, uh, on the sea. Um, in January of, of uh, 18, 1898, um, there was a lot of unrest going on in Havana. And as a result of that unrest uh, that was taking place, um, Lee had talked with Sigsby and said, hey, listen, if I have some problems down here that I need you here very quickly, and uh, the Maine was actually stationed down in Tampa at the time, um, I will send you a signal. Two dollars or two bits. One is get ready, get up steam, ready to come down. The other is I need you right now. Um, interestingly enough, what ended up happening early in uh, January was is that this signal was actually sent. Uh, may or may not necessarily have been Lee that sent the message, uh, but it was received by Sigsby, and Sigsby had picked it up and said, "Full steam, let's go." So the main ends up heading down to Havana and gets put at um, station number four, uh, which is like right in the center of Havana. Um, and you know, kind of interesting how uh, the, the, uh, the, Spaniard, the Spaniards were very, very interested as to why the, uh, why the Maine was there, um, as well as what was, what was happening, why the United States had sent um, the Maine to uh, to Cuba. Um, one of the reasons that was actually prepared, uh, put out uh, why the Maine was there was to make sure that the uh, American citizens were, were protected with all the riots that were taking place uh, during the time frame. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that had occurred that kind of um, sparked the fire, if you will, was Enrique Dupe de um, was the was the minister of, uh, was the foreign minister for uh, Spain um, to the United States. He was in negotiations, if you will, with uh, with McKinley about our McKinley staff uh, with respect to what was going on in Cuba and whether or not Spain was going to have uh, have its fingers in there. Um, Delome, interestingly enough, put together a, a memo um, which derided McKinley as a spineless uh, diplomat. Uh, not being able to, to be able to determine what was going on. Um, this infuriated the United States. Um, McKinley was trying to turn the other cheek, but a lot of people were just fuming uh, as a result of this, including Teddy Roosevelt, who at the time said, okay, well, if you are going to sit back and let this guy uh, deride you and, and, and cut you down, then I'm going to put together my own little Rough Riders, which is where the Rough Riders would come from, um, to run down to Cuba and we're going to kick these guys' butts. He resigned his position in the, uh, uh, in the cabinet as the assistant secretary of the Navy in order to put this, this brigade together, uh, which shipped out from Tampa after the, uh, uh, after the conflict had broken, broken out in April. Um, in February of 1869, uh, 1898, uh, the Maine had exploded and, and there were a lot of questions as to um, oh my God, you know, the, Spain had actually done this. Had Spain actually done this, 
Um, it, was someone else involved? Um, was somebody trying to set Spain up for this? Was it, uh, was it the Cuban revolutionaries that were trying to do this? Uh, and, and several theories were going around as to what actually caused uh, the demise of the name and the eventual start of the uh, Spanish-American War. Was there an abandoned mine attached to the Maine's mooring that drifted into the hull and actually exploded? This is kind of where the investigation uh, settled on. Even though it explored, was there a Spanish submarine that was taking place at the time? Remember, Holland was actually putting together, uh, from a his historical standpoint, Holland was putting together his boat. Uh, Athenian Ram had already been, uh, uh, been out there a little bit, and Spain and France were actually trying to put together submarines at the time. Uh, but there was no evidence of, 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 um, of that. Was it was sabotage involved? Um, you know, conspiracy theories would probably be uh, you know rampant uh, associated with potential sabotage. Um, but what actually had occurred was there was a coal fire which caused the explosion um, with respect to the name, and we'll get get into that discussion here uh, shortly. Um, so. What ended up happening is, is that the, the investigation which took place settled on, it had to be a mine, uh, a Spanish mine on the outside, whether it was abandoned or not. Spain was responsible, wars declared uh, in April of 1868. Um, relatively quickly, um, the war was, was, uh, was taken care of um, and the United States ended up freeing Cuba uh, from, uh, um, from Spain. Included with this was the was the uh, was the Philippines, um, the, the Manila being attacked uh, as well, um, and that was a pretty quick um, quick move. Now, there was an additional investigation which took place in 1911, um, which kind of looked at some of the forensic evidence associated with um, associated with the main itself. And if you take a look at the, the this is really kind of just what the, what it all looked like is, is that you take a look at these plates that actually had formed where the explosion had taken place. The conclusion was is that because of this hull plating here, that the explosion had taken place outside, pushed this in, exploded everything on the inside for the second um, repeat, if you will, um, from, uh, from that area, which blew out the other pieces of the, of the hull plating itself, um, as well as the keel. Um, and it really didn't fit um, with all of the information that had taken place. And as a result, in 1975, Hansen and Price postulated the following events had actually led to the explosion of the main. The coal, which was in this coal bunker, Alpha 16, had inadequate ventilation for bituminous coal uh, because the main was actually designed to use anthracite. Um, I'm going to get into the chemistry and kind of bore you to death here for a second, but bituminous coal has a higher volatility content um, than anthracite coal. Bituminous coal is available down south more than it actually is up north, and the, and the uh, main had actually coal um, down in the area of Tampa and Alabama um, during this time frame. Ended up getting bituminous coal in their, uh, in their bunkers. Now, <clears throat> there had been um, coal fires in several uh, several vessels uh, already. Um, Cincinnati is one that actually comes to mind. Um, and, and the spontaneous combustion of coal was something that did occur, especially if there was inadequate ventilation, high humidity, and warmer temperatures, which is exactly what you had in, in Cuba. Now the heat from this bunker ignited the gunpowder, which was actually stored in an adjacent magazine. So there's your first explosion, um, explosion of the six inch um, reserve magazine results in the explosion, part of the contents of the other adjacent magazines. So you actually had an internal explosion which had taken place and the postulation of this type of uh, uh, explosion um, Admiral Rickover had taken a look at this and, and took a really hard look at it and said, this is actually what happened, end of story. Um, so we, we actually entered and went to war under a false pretense. So um, now, interestingly enough, Wainwright, 
Wainwright was responsible for several of the investigations of the coal fires on the ships prior to uh, his assignment to the main. Kind of just an interesting little sidelight of the story. Havana Secret was written in dedication to the 266 men who died um, on the vessel itself that night in February of 1890. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there were 89 survivors, uh, 18 of them officers, um, including Sigsby and, uh, and Wainwright and several of the other ones. Kind of an interesting, um, interesting little piece uh, associated with, um, with the main, um, the sinking of the main. So, um, you know, that's the, that's the, that's probably one of the books that I really enjoyed um, writing uh, from a, uh, from a novelized history standpoint, a lot of detail, uh, it's pretty dense, um, but it just got, I, I really enjoyed writing, uh, writing the book itself, and digging into all of the little nuances and, and caveats that were, that were there, and to put together that story of what had taken place um, with these characters. Now, what actually started my writing career was uh, writing a family saga called Tell Me Simon's Tale of Tom um, And this is a story about my grandfather. There's a, there's a ghostly image of him over uh, Telmani itself. Um, and it, well, it starts uh, 1912 timeframe. Um, and one of the trips that I had taken back to Latvia, um, I did, did a little bit of photography in order to try to get, um, get just the right picture that I could use for a cover. Um, this is the Tower in Tasis, which has uh, several of the um, uh, several of the scenes um, that had taken place during, uh, during Symmix uh, in and of itself. Um, this is a picture of the brigade that my, uh, my grandfather was in. There's an X over his, his, uh, uh, his face. Uh, this is my grandfather itself. Um, the brigade was actually stationed in Astrakhan um, at the time of the breakout of the Russian Revolution. Um, unfortunately, several of these men were, uh, were eliminated because they were Tsarist cavalry. <clears throat> they did not belong to the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, Volomars, um, who was my grandfather, uh, actually escaped. Um, went through the woods um, between uh, Astrakhan and the, and the lower part of, of southern, uh, southern Europe and moved up to Latvia in order to become uh, part of the uh, Latvian, um, uh, Latvian Revolution for independence in 1920. Um, this is another picture, I tried, to, I tried to expand it a little bit of, uh, of Voldemars itself. Um, you can see where the X is of, uh, of where he was in the picture. Uh, kind of an interesting, interesting little piece. Um, all of these guys were, uh, were interesting faces to, to try to investigate, um, especially with no detail um, other than that postcard. Uh, this is a, a castle in Bauska, um, which, which is an uh, uh, interesting little place to take a look at. A couple of scenes in the book are associated with, uh, with Bowskin itself. Um, and this is actually uh, just a, a nice little picture of the downtown Riga, um, which I kind of enjoyed uh, taking a look at. Uh, this is um, a Latvian's um, Statue of Liberty, if you will. Um, Brivia, uh, Brivius and uh, um, and um, Kesman, which is the liberty and, and, and freedom. Uh, three stars indicating the three uh, provinces of Latvia itself. Um, and this is the picture that I had taken, which became part of the uh, cover of the book. Um, it's the house that my mother had grown up in. Um, this is this is Telmani um, in in Latvia itself. Uh, definitely an interesting uh, interesting construction. Um, you can actually see some of the similar construction in the northwest section of uh, of Connecticut, uh, up in an area called Mount Rio. Interesting enough. Um, as I had mentioned before. Uh, I, I also had written under a pen name, Connie Mickelson, Sarah's Home, um, which was a, a soft paranormal romance uh, associated with um, uh, 1990s uh, timeframe. Um, a couple of um, uh, twins, uh, Sarah and Sharon, um, actually uh, had, had owned this house or Sarah had actually owned the house um, as her respite from, from Boston. Sarah dies in the house as a result of cancer. Um, her twin uh, has to sell the house, ends up selling the house to a nice guy that comes in from Chicago. And sure enough, Sarah, still living in the house because she's the spirit of the house, if you will, and works as a, uh, um, as a matchmaker between her sister, her twin sister, and uh, this guy who bought the house. Kind of an interesting little twist, uh, neat little story. Um, 
kind of enjoyed uh, enjoyed writing this as a little uh, different than, uh, than historical fiction that I typically write. Um, now, what I'm working on right now um, is uh, secrecy and game, gamesmanship, which is kind of focused around the time frame of the uh, um, of the uh, uh, McKinley assassination. Uh, kind of a couple of couple little snippets uh, that was going on during the time frame 1901. Uh, anarchism is very active. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany was driving a plot to invade the United States. The Holland submarine, I can't seem to get my head above water, if you will, um, was designed, um, and the United States had, uh, the United States Navy had bought that. Other countries were also building submarines. Um, the Holland design and, and uh, Simon Lake's design uh, were, were, were integral parts of the story itself. And likewise, the Panama Canal and the start of the Panama Canal, um, which um, Roosevelt, now the vice president, uh, was working toward to try to make sure the United States had their uh, had their had their feet in the water um, down in Central America. <clears throat> now, a lot of it focuses on McKinley being shot in Buffalo um, by this uh, uh, by an anarchist um, who was actually a uh, Eastern European um, immigrant. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting that one of the pieces that I'm dealing with in the story is a, uh, uh, is a, is a soldier from the Buffalo, um, Buffalo soldiers, uh, the 10th Cavalry, um, which had actually saved um, Roosevelt in, uh, in his battle for San Juan Hill. The 10th Cavalry was, a, was an all black unit. Um, and this individual, uh, by the name of uh, Ben Parker, um, is a very important piece of the story as to you know what the evils of Jim Crow were during this time frame and how this individual, even though he was a hero at the time, um, was not given the uh, given the credit that, uh, that he deserved. A lot of lot of interesting little pieces, um, uh, a lot of a lot of density um, in the uh, in this story. Uh, I'm really enjoying writing it. You know, it's just taking me a lot of time to do. It. So that kind of puts everything together for you. Um, that's, uh, that's what I've got to offer, Chris. Yeah, that was great. That was a great presentation. Um, I got Jamie, uh, he asks, uh, most of the book settings are in war. Do you have a particular interest in war history or is there something else that sparked interest enough to write the books? It, it's, uh, it, that's a great question. Actually, what I'm, what I'm more focused on, um, recently anyway, are the, are the submarines. Um, in each of the story, there's some piece of the story which is a development of the submarine. What's going on with that? Um, how it's how that's actually moving forward. Um, I was I was not a um, I was not a um, I, I'm not a veteran, um, but I I work with a lot of Navy people, um, a lot of people from uh, uh, from the military, but definitely an interesting, um, uh, interesting question, and you know maybe maybe there is a little bit of the, the, the war history piece that's there. Um, Talmud Steinitz, uh, by the way, takes place during World War One, um, and yesterday was Remembrance Day uh, for the majority of the world, uh, as well as Veterans Day. So it's kind of a uh, kind of an interesting uh, interesting place where it comes. Did I lose everybody, or are you still there? No, no, we're still here. Um, okay. So you mentioned uh, at towards the beginning that uh, finding the skeletons on the Hunley and um, your uh, background in chemistry is what drew you to the Hunley in the first uh, to write about the Hunley. What was it that drew you to writing historical fiction in general instead of fantasy or something else? And then what? Uh, uh, what specific for each of your books drew you to that specific, like the Hunley, um, the Spanish American war? I, I, I think I've always had a passion for history. Um, I, I had a, a great, uh, high school education in, uh, in central New York. Um, and I was given a lot of, a lot of stimulation, if you will, in the historical perspective of, um, um, of, of what was what was going on. Um, now, the, the 
family saga, Talmud of the Symix, was was actually where it's where my heavy writing started. And Symix um, is, is is kind of a historical piece digging into the history of what was going on with Latvia because not a whole lot's written about what was going on during that time frame, especially from my family standpoint. Um, so kind kind of focus on the history of of the country that I you know, my home country, which I didn't know, I didn't grow up in, um, but really enjoyed having the time to be able to uh, take a look at what was going on there. Now, <clears throat> Convergence of Valor uh, was spurred on, you know, as I had mentioned by a friend of mine down in, down in South Carolina who said, hey, Cooter, you got to go take a look at this thing. You know, this is a, uh, um, a submarine from the Civil War um, that they're pulling up. And, you know, I kind of looked at him you know, side-eyed and said, hey, wait a second, what are you talking about here? Um, but that, that kind of spurred me on to the convergence of valor. And what's the human side of that? What's the, what are the sailors thinking about when they're stuffing themselves into a, you know, into a four foot diameter tube and trying to go under the water? Havana Secret were the little, little nuances, the little pieces and parts uh, that were going on behind the sinking of the, uh, uh, sinking of the main. Um, I originally had thought that you know, maybe there's a mystery behind the sinking of the main itself. And there, there was a little bit kind of resolved in 1975, but you know, what was happening beforehand was kind of kind of interesting as well. So that's that's how Havana's secret kind of developed. Um, and the secrecy and game, gamesmanship, um, you know, what actually happened with um, uh, you know, with the with the assassination of McKinley and the and and Roosevelt popping up. I mean, just about all of these situations kind of moving, uh, moving imperialism a little bit more forward each, each day. So that, that's kind of why I've focused a little bit on novelized history um, as, as the genre that I enjoy uh, writing. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of research that was done in all the books. Uh, what was, what's your method for doing the research? Um, and then part two, what is the most surprising find while you were doing your research, either in each book separately or just in general? What was the most surprising thing that you found? Um, I, I spent a lot of time in libraries trying to find the biographies of the individuals involved um, in, uh, in the story itself. Um, so a lot of the information, a lot of the research um, is actually through the books. For example, The Rise of Teddy Roosevelt, um, Theodore Rex uh, was another book that I kind of looked at, uh, The Spanish War, uh, McKinley in the, in the, uh, um, the Spanish-American War. And as I had mentioned in the credits for um, Convergence of Valor, um, there was a, a lot of information that was actually being provided right up front. Now, the thing to keep in mind with with the with the Hunley is it was a secret weapon, um, so there was not a whole lot of stuff that was that was maintained uh, associated with um, with the Hunley. Um, but you know, trying to get that information, it was the friends of the Hunley that helped out a lot in digging up the information, and then you know, consistent or constantly working back into all of the Civil War literature that was out there. Of you know, hey, there's this little fish boat. Um, it was here at the time. It was there at the time, and and these are what the individuals are that, uh, that may have been associated with, uh, with the boat itself. The, the, the most surprising thing associated with, um, with Convergence of Valor was is that four of the eight sailors were European. Um, and, and, and Miller's background, uh, Mueller, Miller, whatever his name was, was really kind of interesting that he had none. He had no background at all. Um, had to actually conjure up something uh, for, you know, how, how, and why he was he, he was there. Um, surprises out of out of Havana Secret. Um, kind kind of the the um, the coincidences associated with Wainwright uh, surprised me uh, surprised me quite a bit. Um, I just kind of figured that he had a had a long history, you know, associated with uh, his family being um, being in the military. But the the fact that he was um, the Office of Naval, he was the head investigator or the head spy, if you will, for O&I prior to uh, his assignment to the, um, 
kind of to the to the uh, to the main. And and now as I'm working on secrecy and gamesmanship, uh, Wainwright is now the head of um, Naval Academy, uh, providing training. And Sigsby is now the head of the Office of Naval Investigation. So there's kind of a little yeah, that kind of surprised me a little bit as to how you know that tie um, actually took place uh, associated there. Um, so that, that I think that answers the question. Yeah, yep. So with all this research, what is your writing process? How do you um, take all that research and then f obviously fill in the blanks uh, with the fiction part of it? But do you do an outline? Do you have everything on a computer? Do you have everything on notes and then try to put it all together? What's your writing process and putting the book together with all the facts that you went out and found? The, 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 the process, I'm, I'm a pantser. I'll, I'll just admit it right up front. Um, <laughs> and and, and I, 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 I have tried doing the outline routine. I've tried doing, um, you know, index cards and it, it's, it just doesn't seem to work well for me, even though I know I need to do that. Um, it gets me into trouble when I don't um, because, you know, like I posted the other day, um, you know, I got through um, a read as I'm doing the developmental edit for secrecy and gamesmanship. Um, you know, I'm, I'm halfway through it. And then I realized that, Hey, wait a second, this timeline's all screwed up. I got to change out, change out some of the, uh, um, you know, some of the, the, um, some of the way the, 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 the chapters are sequenced because I've got them in the wrong sequence. You know, I've got, I've got somebody up in Buffalo when he should be down in, down in DC. And, and, you know, the same person that he's chasing is actually up in Toronto, you know, at this time frame, um, in order to make the story, uh, story cohesive. Um, so, um, it, it gets me into trouble by being a pantser, but I kind of enjoy, um, you know, just kind of writing on the fly like that, you know, kind of working through the storyline and then uh, and then going back afterwards to try to uh, uh, try to regroup and say, OK, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Um, and, and let me try to fit in you know, where things where things go. Um, the, the, the research piece, um, I am I am um, I'm addicted to rabbit holes. I'll admit that right now. Um, I'll start digging onto something. And just keep on running down that rabbit hole until I finally, you know, get to the point three days later saying, wait a second, why, why am I over here when I should be, you know, focused on this piece right here? I've already, I've already got the answer that I needed and, and let's move on. But um, I, I just, I enjoy history. I enjoy the little nuances of history and that kind of, um, kind of drives me to try to try to put the, the story together as it is. Um, unfortunately, like I said, as a pantser, typically what I'll end up doing is I'll go back and make the outline up a little bit later um, in order to, 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 to plan it out. Um, because I think I might even have. Oh, there you go. Plot, <laughs> plot line for. <laughs> Plot line for secrecy and gamesmanship. That's uh, it's kind of one, one of the things that I was working on to try to make sure that I had everybody where they were supposed to be. Now, are, do you have multiple uh, stories going on at the time, or do you work on just one one book at a time? Um, I, I, I focus on one at a time, and, and my focus right now is secrecy and game and gamesmanship. Um, the um, but but I do have about three or four other balls that are up in the air that I'm thinking about. And every once in a while, I'll throw a couple of lines in there. Um, as an example, uh, Talmud of I'm, I'm not, um, I, I'm not really happy with the way it turned out. Um, I'd like to go back and maybe do a little bit of a little bit more editing on, on Symix, um, which was the, the story about my grandfather. And, and I do have two follow-ups to that is one is um, my mother's story coming out of that, um, that I've got little snippets, pieces, and parts. So I'll sit and dream off of uh, a couple of photographs that I end up digging up uh, that somebody had posted. Um, so I, I've got two, I'll call them bubbles 
in the in the Symix um, region. One about my mother, and one about my uh, my, my father, um, because both were both were immigrants to the states after World War II. Um, I do have another bubble coming after um, uh, gamesmanship, uh, uh, secrecy, and gamesmanship uh, about the Panama Canal. I haven't quite figured out what the what the title, what the gist, um, but I do like. Uh, the continuity that will take place between uh, Sam Carter and um, Ben Parker, uh, the two guys that I'm kind of you know, pairing up together in, um, uh, in secrecy, that they're going to end up heading down to Central America to work on what's going on and what Teddy Roosevelt actually needs in order to get the land for the Panama Canal Zone. Um, so I've got that, that piece there. And, and I've also got another bubble just kind of bouncing off the wall every once in a while is what about this, this romance thing? Is there something else that's there um, that I might be able to tie in history? Um, and, and the bubble that I've been thinking with that one is actually a story of um, the, the place that I grew up in is called the Ghosts of the Flats. Um, in, in Seneca Falls, New York, um, there, was, there used to be Seneca Falls. Um, which was a river that went through um, uh, through the center, center of town, uh, which is now part of the Barge Canal because they came in, dredged it all out, you know, put up the uh, you know, put up the blockades and, and, and filled in Van Cleef Lake. Um, but they had to move houses and they had to uh, confiscate some of the houses themselves. So the Ghost of the Flats is another bubble that's kind of kind of out there. I'm thinking of how to put that story together from the 1800s uh, coming out of uh, coming out of my hometown. So um, focus one, and a lot of these other bubbles that are kind of bouncing off the wall every once in a while, and nice little distractions. So it sounds like the Panama Canal one, and sort of each one starting with Convergence has sort of grown out of the previous ones. So you have Convergence, then Havana Secret. It sounds like it kind of grew out of, did it grow out of the research that you did for for Convergence, and then um, Secrecy, and 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 um, gamesmanship, that one grew out of Havana Secret and Panama. Bingo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Kind of, you know, the little, little snippets and pieces that actually kind of, you know, slide out there saying, oh, well, yeah, it's not really happening right now, but yep. I've, I've got, you know, in, the, in those ideas that are not, um, that don't fit, um, into the books that I'm doing or a big book that I'm focused on right now. I've got folders that are sitting in there in the, in the computer, you know, just you know, throw that little information in there to, to kind of follow up on, on at a later date. You mentioned the timelines that didn't match. Have you, how often have you backed yourself into a corner like that and had to go and rewrite entire chapters or entire paragraphs or sections to make sure that everything uh, meshes correctly? Um, Convergence, I think, two or three times. Havana Secret, two or three times. Um, and, and right now in secrecy, um, uh, I think I'm up to six, <laughs> six, <laughs> six times. Well, what was it that, um, that how, how did you realize that, that something didn't fit? Um, it, it, as, as I was trying to read through um, uh, as as I was working later on, you know, doing on on one of the edits, uh, working later on in the story, um, I realized that I had either forgotten or the individual um, that I was kind of focused on at that point, like three quarters of the way through, um, couldn't be there because of where I had put the guy about halfway through. So. It's 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 kind of one of those aha oh crap moments um, <laughs> that, that that opened me up to that. But I I, I get myself into that and and it's, it's self inflicted. Uh, I'm a pantser yeah. and I know it. So with with, with these uh, books that have and actually they all have the first two anyways. I read most of Convergence. Uh, I got started on Havana Secret. There's there's a little bit of um, sort of a, a spy element to it. I believe it was Convergence starts over in 
England, I think, and they get the yep. plans for the for the thing, and then he inserts himself into the the, the shipbuilding down in down in um, Charleston there. So there's and and same with Havana. Uh, so going from that to um, a romance. Now I know you had mentioned you had said this to me before um, that this was it was sort of a challenge. Somebody had challenged you to write. Um, a romance novel how difficult was that to write compared to your other books it was absolutely grueling <laughs> <laughs> I, I i didn't have anything to refer to to get a sense of um what the individuals that i'm dealing with would be like all all i could do was um, try to figure out, okay, what was it like back in the nineties? Um, and you know, I, I, I know I've got a couple of scenes in there where, um, he's, he's using one question that a reader had at one point on, uh, on, on, uh, Sarah's home was, is that, well, why didn't he just text her and tell her to be there? I said, well, we didn't have texting back then, and nor did we have the cell phones to be able to pick up and, you know, off and going. And, um, the answering machines were just barely, uh, barely available um, at that time frame. So it, 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 I, I, it scared the hell out of me because it was kind of, I was, I was sitting there trying to figure out how do I develop a storyline out of the 1980s, I think it was late 80s is where I was going. Um, where I was starting it, um, and, and, and what were people like? What were what were people trying to trying to do? Trying to get forward? Trying, you know, you, you, what type of technology was actually out there? Um, so the I, I was hamstrung by the research because I didn't have you know a book about you know an almanac from 1984 which kind of explained how this you know how this individual would would act you know how he would how, how he would deal with things you know type of deal so um it was it was it was scary at first but once i got a storyline down and started working through the storyline it, it it kind of blossomed and, and i enjoyed writing it because it was everything came you know out of the mind you know, everything was it was just my imagination that was there you had a, 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 a paranormal twist in it as well. How was that to write something, write that into the story? Um, I was winging it. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what kind of hit me on that was is that when, when, I, when I first moved into this house, um, you know, it, it had been empty for um, six months, eight months or whatever. Um, and, and the person that had, I bought the house from actually it was the estate that I bought the house from. Um, the, the person had died. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, what are these sounds at night going on? What are these sounds telling me at night? So you get the, you get, you get the dream works going, if you will, and start thinking about, you know, how, how it all fits. Um, you know how how I uh, how a benevolent spirit would actually do something. What a what would a um, what would a fortune teller actually you know try to tell somebody, try to direct them in, in one direction or another direction, you know, type of deal. So it was it was you know, like I said, it was winging it. Well, in this book compared to your other ones, obviously your other ones are based around historical figures. This one here, did you did you use family or friends to kind of draw on characteristics to to build your characters? Um, or did you just wing it? There, 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 there were one or two. Um, um, old, old friends that uh, I haven't talked to in like 30 years, stuff that I remember, um, you know, like an old girlfriend or something that had, uh, had, had gigged me, you know, type of deal. So 
for the most part, no. Um, characters were all pretty much constructed um, as to what what an individual coming from Chicago, coming to uh, you know coming to New England would be like. You know, what 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 would it be like for them? Um, what would it be like for 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 someone? Um, who was a musician, um, enjoyed music, but enjoyed plants and, and uh, landscaping more so. So she goes into that direction while her sister goes into, into the music piece. Um, had to have a little bit of the Cruella in there um, with the uh, with antagonist. Um, so I just kind of, kind of, kind of, Pulled that one out of out of thoughts as to what a uh, what a, what an old um, um, money hungry owner of a uh, of a school would be like. I'll just, I'll just leave it there. So um, <laughs> yeah, pieces and parts of of friends from years gone by, but nobody nobody recent. Okay. So let's talk about your, um, your, your just writing process in general. Uh, you, you say you, you kind of do things on the seat of your pants. You don't do outlines or very rarely, but um, do you have a particular um, time that you like to write or is it just sort of when an idea comes, you sit down, you write, you know, we've had some that like to write first thing in the morning with a cup of coffee, things are quiet. Some like to write when there's just total chaos in the house because they can focus when uh, do you have any traditions or superstitions as well when, when you write? Well, I I, I used to um, I used to enjoy doing it in the morning, um, you know, getting up at three and, and kind of working through and maybe a little bit of uh, um, a little bit of mood music you know associated with that and, and, and working through you know three or four pages or so um, prior to uh, you know, prior to prior to work. Um, but recently that's, that's, that's changed. Um, I've, I, because of, of duties around the house, if you will, associated with my, with my, uh, senior dog, um, I spent, I'm spending a lot more time with her, um, late in the evening, early morning. So I don't really have the writing time there. So the, the, the time frame right now, when she's sacked out, Hopefully for you know a couple of hours or so. Um, that's the time that I'm using to to, to focus on writing now. Um, and, and typically it's quiet. You know, I like to have it a little bit of quiet so I can focus on it. Um, if I'm if I'm stuck on something, um, I'll typically use a little bit of um, a little bit of Pandora to uh, give me. Some motivation, uh, depending on where I'm going. Um, the the two steps from hell, um, head banging stuff is is pretty good for motivation on some of the stuff. Um, in other cases, it's it's uh, classical music, you know, the the Beethoven, Mozart. You know, try to try to work through the progressions. So evening time now, I've kind of switched that a little bit, and and I'm sure once once things change. I'll probably end up going back to uh, back to the morning routine again. Yeah, so rituals, not superstitions, is what I was trying to get at. But um, so all your books are self-published versus That's going the traditional publishing route. What? Uh, how did you decide to to do that? Um, I, I I tried pushing Talmud Usimix through the traditional publishing route way way back when and. You know, basically got my um, head handed to me saying that, you know, nobody's really interested in this stuff. Okay. Um, so I, I went through uh, iUniverse um, at the time to kind of work through the, the pieces and parts of uh, publishing to, to get it published, get it out there. Um, Convergence of Valor, the first edition of it was actually, I went through iUniverse was that as well. Um, but once I got the feel for what I had to do in order to make a good product, 
um, decided that, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to go the self-publishing. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a best-selling author. I know that um, at this point, I'm probably not going to be a best-selling author until I'm dead. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll work the stories. I like telling the stories is, is really where, where it comes down to. So I'll, I'll, I'll work the story until it's, I, I feel it's good. Um, using alpha readers, beta readers, um, trying to come up with a design cover by myself. All, all, all the covers are, are my own thought process. Um, I, I enjoy the independence. I enjoy the, the, the independence of, of being self-published. What was the most difficult part of self-publishing? Marketing. What are some of the important things that you learned about marketing, how to market, what needs to be marketed, or, or um, how, how to go about doing it? Uh, make, make, make sure the cover reflects the story and is eye-catching. Um, and work the shoe leather. Um, get to the get to the bookstores. Um, you know, show them your wares. Talk through it. Um, do the uh, um, do the libraries. Uh, my my shtick is the uh, historically speaking um, presentations. You know, put the presentation together, which is the historical perspective behind the book itself, and that tends to to help out with some of the marketing. Um, social media is always a always a big thing, but I'm, I'm I don't really do a whole lot of social media, which I probably should, um, but I don't, I don't do enough of it. Um, but the big thing is, is getting your face out there and um, making sure you have a good product, obviously, bring it out and, and, and make sure it shows. And do you have uh, regulars that you use for, for beta readers or um, just sort of ask anybody um i've got one fellow out in california that um does a real good job um for me um he's, he's very interested in what i write um so it's it, it's a it's a nice symbiosis that we have he sends me his stuff and i send him my stuff um and we critique each other uh, in order to drive drive those driving the conclusion um, I do have a couple of people that I'll use off and on nearby, um, but I won't use, I, I typically won't use people nearby as an entire beta reader. Um, I'll just kind of like send them sections. I have have a couple of friends that, a um, couple of writing friends that um, have offered, so I'm not going to turn it down. I'll send them the whole script and say, what are your thoughts? You know, what uh, what am I missing? You know, what do I need to, what do I need to fix? What do I need to adjust? Where's my timeline screwed up? <laughs> do you use, uh, have you used any professionals, professional editors, professional um, cover artists, or have you done that all yourself um, and through? The, the, through... the first two, uh, the first two were professionally edited. Um, and the, uh, the covers, basically I bought it through, through our universe. Um, I didn't like the cover, so I so I did it myself. Um, I enjoy doing the covers. Um, now, as for, I, I I know that at some point I'm going to have to step into that pond and go professional with respect to um, the the proofreading and stuff. Um, I haven't gotten there yet, and I'm thinking that secrecy is probably going to going to go that direction. But no, I haven't used professionals yet. So are you going to self-publish that one still, or are you going to go? Oh yeah, try yeah, to it'll, it'll, it'll end up being a self-published. Um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll stay with that. I can, you know, I can give it a try. Um, there's one one small um, publishing house out of North Carolina that I'm that I'm looking at um, that might be interested in secrecy, which means that I might be able to slide Havana Secret in there and then Convergence as well. Um, but I haven't gotten to the point where I feel secrecy is ready to go um, to, to provide that to them and try writing that. I, I'd rather go with a smaller 
um, publishing house uh, up first to um, so that we could work you know more closely together than the, than the larger uh, publishing houses and and I and I don't know you know without a name um, you know without uh, without you know a whole list of 10, 10 books out there I, I don't know if I'd be successful going to a going to any of the big six or I think it's maybe a big five now instead of just big six. Yeah. Do you think of uh, doing any of your, uh, having any of your books converted into audiobooks? Um, convergence I've thought of. Um, that's, that's relatively short. The other ones are kind of dense. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, they'd work well as audiobooks. But I have thought of it, um, well, especially the paranormal um, one would, would probably be a good. good Let's say what about Sarah's that. home? That would probably be a good, make a good yeah. audiobook. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So for Convergence, if you could have any voice actor or movie actor, TV actor voice read your book, well, part one, would you rather read it yourself or have somebody read it? And who would that somebody, who would that somebody be? Um, Who's anybody? Well, I lost by chance. Uh, Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would have been a good one. Um, I, 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 I don't think that I could. I, I've done a couple of readings online. Um, you know, during the during the initial phases of the plague, um, we did a couple, um, a couple of discussions with the. Um, sunken submarine club that we have writers club um that um i i don't think my voice goes over well and i don't read well from you know from the books themselves um i i, I did some play acting in in high school um which i kind of enjoyed doing but i don't know if i could really get into the um, the uh, the audio piece um, on my own. I, I just don't think it would work well. Voice is a bit soothing, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hockey coach. <laughs> <laughs> so with with COVID, how has how has that changed the way that you've uh, well, obviously not being able to be in person uh, to market yourself and your still books. There? What are the things? Yeah, I'm still there. Um, kind of froze there for a second. Um, so anyways, for, for, uh, COVID, how has that changed the way you're, you've had to market yourself, market your books, and has that changed how you do your research and your writing? You're still there? Uh, it looks like we may have something happen where it looks like it's frozen. Um, all right. Well, it looks like he's, we're done. So I'd like to thank everybody for um, joining us. Hopefully we can have him back at another time. And uh, we appreciate everybody coming. Again, uh, Convergence of Valor. Uh, Havana Secret, Sarah's Home are all available at a Freethinkers Corner uh, in store and through our website. And uh, uh, we do um, ship as well. So again, we appreciate everybody for coming. Thank you very much. Have a good night.